Welcome in, everybody, to another edition of Sad Times. I'm your host, Kevin. Thank you so much for stopping by. Well, let's just go ahead and say again what the show is and what it's about. Um, Also, I say um and uh a lot, I learned, and when I was listening to the show, and it made me want to beat my head against the wall. So I'm going to try to do less of that this time, so we'll see what happens. So Sad Times. Sad Times is a show that uh, we have a podcast episode. This is obviously a podcast, and we bring people on, and each time uh, we have a person tell a story or stories from their lives, times that they felt uh, sad, upset, depressed, angry, any sort of really emotional way, Um, and we are not trying to fix that person. What we're doing is we're allowing that person to tell their story in hopes that people who are out there listening might feel a little less alone. They might say, oh, I had that experience or, oh, my God, I thought I was the only one who felt that way, etc. So that's kind of what we're doing here on Sad Times. Of course, like everything else in this beautiful country, Sad Times would not exist without our sponsor. Our sponsor, of course, is – say it with me, everyone – Fuck Cigarettes. That's Fuck Cigarettes. Lean back, light a fuck, and – Exhale. Ah, fuck. Uh, also, uh, this 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 episode here, just to give a little inside baseball, we're doing on Zoom. And I'm also realizing now that if you have a business where you have a competitor maybe in town and you would like to possibly take away customers from that competitor, I will sell mm, pictures of my face. And you could put on a billboard and just say, let's just say you own a bread company and they own a bread company. You can just put on there and say, hey, Johnson Bread Company, whoever you're – this is what the owner looks like. And people are going to stop fucking buying that bread. So uh, go ahead and reach out to me. I don't even know how you do it. I think I'm on Facebook. I don't know. Uh, and uh, we can we can, we can can talk because I've always wanted to put my horrible face on a billboard. <laughs> I almost said speaking of horrible faces, but I'm not going to do that. (laughs) Today is an exciting day. We have our first returning champion on the program, the great Michael. Now, Michael and I have known each other. We're coming up on 22 years, almost exactly, uh, that I've known Michael, which is fucking insane. Michael, before we get to your past episode, let's start with uh, the basics. How are you doing today? I'm doing all right. Yeah. How about you? Uh, other than the fact that I have my face, I'm doing okay. <laughs> I know that you quit smoking years ago, but mm-hmm. I did send you two cartons of fuck. So oh, great. make sure to light one of those up during the show. Okay. Well, thanks. So, Michael, I got a you... a pile of fuck next to me right here. That... <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. And that's why we take those ad dollars. Michael, you were the fourth guest ever on Sad Times uh, way back in 2019, I believe it was, if I remember correctly. And you are now back. It is now 2023 and you're back. And thank you for coming on the show. Let's um, catch – pardon me. I was stabbing myself in the leg because I said um. (laughs) Ow. So, Mike, you came on. Do you want to – well, actually, let's talk about how we know each other. We've known each other for 22 years. We have lived together, not only in the same city, not only in the same (laughs) apartment, but in the same bedroom in beautiful middle – northern middle Ohio, I guess it would be. Uh, We also lived together here in beautiful Chicago for a long time. Uh, What else? We've done a lot of theater together. You played my child once true yeah so michael uh and we text a lot about uh anxiety and yeah life anxiety yeah i always every time you text me about that i have to google it because i don't know what that is but <laughs> i'm always like oh that sounds unpleasant i yeah. hope mike isn't feeling that way yes we do text about life a lot we text about the beatles a lot Mm-hmm. We text about anxiety a lot, depression a lot. You and I, I remember almost 10 years ago when I was in India, I was in India for work for three months. I, re- I remember sending you very long emails because I was just very anxious and uh, I was I was dealing with a lot of stuff and it was the best experience of my life, but it was very challenging. 
Some I met some of the best human beings I'll ever meet when I was there in in beautiful Chennai, India. So, uh, you know, I I always knew that I could reach out to you and you would understand uh, in, from the anxiety front and the depression front. And I, I, that's something I've always, of course, very much appreciated about you. Likewise, absolutely, absolutely the same. Yeah, we uh, yeah, <clears throat> we've experienced a lot of the same. Uh, types of anxiety and we feel the same about a lot of things so likewise i know i can always reach out to you and talk about those things yeah and uh i i just can't tell you how much i appreciate it that i i always know i can reach out to you so um yeah anxiety is is certainly something we have in common uh you were on when you were on uh the last time we talked a little bit about that but uh, one of the things we really uh that you were just so brave and honest about uh, was your struggle with drug addiction. And it was it it was just I, I, look again inside baseball. I knew the main topics we were going to talk about, obviously. But as we were doing the show, I was blown away by your your honesty, your forthrightness. I think that's the same thing, although only one's a Billy Joel song. Um, you and I had that good discussion and you were just so honest and raw about it. And I, I often point people to that episode when they want to understand a little bit about like, well, what is the sad times, et cetera, because of the way that you told your story. So kudos to you for being so honest about that. And thank you for that. Thanks. And for anybody who's listening to this and hasn't listened to it again, it's it's in the old archives there. Episode number four, back when we were on show on Twitch, <laughs> which, uh, yeah, it's a good time. So you, what, uh, what, what was the drug that you were dealing with that we discussed just to kind of give a, 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 a backup here before we go into, you know, today's episode, what was the drug that you were struggling with and, and, and what kind of became of that? Yeah, the, the drug that really brought it all to a head and that led me to finally seek help and go to rehab, uh, I went to the hospital was heroin and it wasn't, you know, just went directly to heroin, mm-hmm. kind of the short story of how I ended up there was I'd had uh, a tonsillectomy at like 40 years old, and it was, went badly. I had to go back to the emergency room a couple of times with massive bleeding and had to have like my throat recarterized, and they kept giving me, you know, uh, lots of painkillers. That is supposed to be one of the most for an adult. I mean, I think it's really painful for children, but it's my understanding that as an adult to have your tonsils out is one of the most painful procedures. Is that correct? It's pretty bad. And like I said, mine wasn't typical. I had I had like two other surgeries, emergency surgeries after that one, and they actually increased my dosage. And then I asphyxiated on blood and got... Uh, pneumonia and I got pleurisy, which is, you know, inflammation of the sac around your lungs. So I was just in constant pain, pain, just trying to breathe. And they gave me a lot of Oxycontin. And then uh, weeks down the road, they just stopped prescribing it to me and I got sick. So. They just stopped. Yeah. Which, by the way, when Mike uh, inhaled his own blood, uh, he automatically got on the ballot for the Heavy Metal Hall of Fame. Congratulations, Mike. <laughs> Thank you. It's it's a big point of pride for me. All right. So you were on OxyContin and then it just stopped. So you probably had some withdrawal. Yeah. Okay. And then I sought out, you know, I sought out other things and that, that kind of just snowballed into heroin in the end. Okay. And, you know, I don't want to Again, you can listen to the other episode to, to kind of hear the, the, the heroin details of that story. Um, so you, um, when we talked last, it was about, like I said, May of 2019. I believe since then you have had uh, a relapse. Is that correct? Yes. I wish I could say that I'm back here telling you how it's been a wonderful and easy journey. And, you know, I never looked back, but, you know. A big part and unfortunately a common part of recovery is relapse. Yeah, I had, and I – listen, this is just coming uh, – something I think I heard once, so I could be very wrong about this. I think I'd heard that only 18 or 19 percent pe- of people who do seek help and rehabilitation for addiction stay off of whatever that 
substance they're addicted to. I don't know if that's the right number, but I do know that it is pretty low. Is Does that sound right to you from your understanding? I don't, I don't have the figures, but yes, I've heard similar things. That mm -hmm. the, uh, yeah. so what the rate of relapse is yeah. very bad. And what led to your relapse? That's the funny thing. I was just thinking about <laughs> this, of course. Well, it's, the, it's the hilarious thing. Now, I was um, just thinking about that. You know, before this this interview, of course, and I can't really put my finger on it exactly what led to it. I, oh wow! But it was just a perfect storm of uh, a lot of stress, of course, in life, and become very unhappy at my job, and yeah, just just felt very I don't know, just hopeless, and I you know, also. I have uh, a bad disc in my back that will recur and give me a lot of pain at times. And it's, it was just, I assume it just became an easy thing to use pain as an excuse to uh, use drugs to relieve mental stress and pain and, you know, an easy out that ends up causing so much more pain. So the the um, so you have the the pain in your back, but also you were saying you you were very stressed about work. I think you and stressed about a number of things. So when you go it, when you did relapse, was one of your th thoughts like this will be an escape from this? Is that kind of what it feels like, or it's just a reprieve for like five hours or however long it is where you don't have to feel that mental pain? That's the thing. You never really, if you're going to relapse and fall back into this, your brain, your addict brain doesn't really connect all the dots. You don't say, you know, what, I'm going to do this and it's going to do this for me. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a lot more sly than that. You know, you convince yourself little by little that this will be okay. And it'll just be, yeah, just dip a little toe and I'll get past this pain and then I'll have a nice, you know, vacation from my problems and then I'll be back again. I'll be okay. But your brain tricks you one too many times and all of a sudden you're addicted again. I have a question about that. It, you know, we talked about anxiety earlier and one of the things um, I really dislike about anxiety is that almost every time it fools me, like almost mm. every time because it feels so real. And then afterwards, as you're looking back, you're like, well, Jesus, that was, you know, my anxiety. That was, yeah. that was whatever. Do you have that same experience with what you call the addict brain? Like, is it like really loud and you're like, this must mean I need to do something. And then later as you come out of it, then you realize, oh, that was the addict brain. Is it, is it similar to that or am I way off base there? Oh, no, absolutely. It's, it's ridiculously simplistic when you look backward. You're like, if I just had not done that, yeah, all these bad things wouldn't have followed. But mm -hmm. like, yeah, the... Your attic brain at that point says, this is a good idea and you'll be fine. You're not going to be like before. It's just going to be a little. You're just going to do this. No. But yeah, your brain, it tricks you. Yeah, that's so scary. One thing that you know, we've learned during recovery and therapy and all this is to think through the steps and think, where will this get me? And it's one of the, the steps, one of the things that I, a process that I go through. You, you know, mean if the, I were to have an urge or something. The 12 steps, you mean? No. Oh, no. <laughs> no. Okay. I, 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 that wasn't trying to make a joke. I <laughs> thought that's what you meant. Oh, no, no, no. No, um, more figurative steps. Just kind of, I have to stop and think to myself, okay, if I take this pill or if I do this drug, yeah, I'll feel a little okay for a while. Then I will hate myself and then... You know, I gotcha. will run the risk of losing all the things that I've worked to regain. Very – okay. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. That's another question I was going to ask you. Well, a couple things. How long was your relapse? It was only a few months. Okay. Uh, two, two and a half months maybe. And I think something – and this is a really difficult question, but you you kind of said you, – you hinted at it when you said you then you hate yourself when you use it. Once you have – trick yourself into doing that and, and you have started using again is the shame when you are not using overpowering and does that play a part in driving you to use more yeah it just it does kind of snowball like that like okay just hating myself to such a degree that hey 
I've already gone this far. I know this will make me feel better for a short while. And that's just another one of the ways that mm -hmm. you kind of fool yourself into active addiction. Yeah. It, it's just one thing feeds the other, I guess. It's yeah. It, uh, in so okay, so it was a couple months. So how long? And then you obviously that means that there was an end to the relapse. Uh, which how long have you been sober now? Uh, December twenty seventh was my one year mark. Just this past oh awesome a couple weeks ago. That's awesome, man! Congratulations, congratulations. Yeah, uh, yeah, and so obviously. That was you. You were talking about some stressors in your life then. Mm -hmm. That was December twenty seventh of twenty twenty one. Yes. Uh, luckily for everybody, twenty twenty two was great. I don't recall any problems in that year. <laughs> no, no. And so now, obviously, you are a human being, so there is stress in your life, but you probably mm -hmm. have different stresses. So, what are you doing? Like, what do you have? Like a treatment plan or anything that you do in order to help you continue to, you know, r remain sober. Actually, I have gone about it differently this time. Okay. Last time in the last episode, I explained I'd gone actually to the hospital for 10 days mm -hmm. and like on a lockdown ward and all that. And then I went to a halfway house after that. And I went to uh, like 60 meetings in 60 days. And I did all that. Mm -hmm. Just kind of really hardcore working it like that. This time I... I did go to the hospital, but just to the ER, and I got referred to a program, like a drug cessation program, and this is a uh, medically assisted program. So I take a deterrent medication. Does that help with like the, um, I think the urges like to want to use, is that is that kind of what well, it does? It helps with the withdrawals, mm -hmm. definitely in the beginning. And I also, you know, I, I went once a week for quite a while. I go twice a week. I mean, not twice a week, once every two weeks now. And it includes drug testing, um, low counseling, one-on-one -on -one meetings, and then the medication I still take. It's called uh, Suboxone. Suboxone. Okay. Yeah. A lot of people have heard of uh, methadone and mm -hmm. methadone clinics, and it's got a really, it's got a bad reputation as being basically just a half step down from heroin, and people have a lot of trouble getting off of it. Suboxone is better than that, but it still is a process where I have to step down to get off of it. And when you say step down, meaning like today I take 10 milligrams, uh, and I'm going to work down to five milligrams, and then down to two, that type of thing? Yeah, I was taking 10 milligrams for a while, then eight milligrams. Now I take six milligrams a couple times a week and eight still the rest. I'm in the process of getting off of Suboxa. Is that difficult? Um, the, basically, stepping down, you get a little bit of a taste of withdrawals. Mm -hmm. Luckily for me, the only thing that, excuse me. Luckily for me, the only way it has affected me is I get like the sweats a little bit, like in the afternoon, if I hadn't yeah. taken my medication on time, I'll get a little overheated, Okay, over sweats. but it's not nearly as bad as it is with actual withdrawals. And yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, speaking of methadone, I was thinking, uh, I was like, when did I first learn about methadone? Because you're right. It's kind of a ubi uh, ubiquitous thing. And like most things that have served me in life, I learned about it from a Kid Rock song. <laughs> yeah. And Brent is nodding his head and stop showing me your Kid Rock tattoo, Brent. Put that <laughs> away. Uh, all my heroes in the method. Okay. Yeah. All right. Sorry about that. Everyone. I'm sorry about that. Everyone. <laughs> uh, that was, Yeah. Okay, so you're you said counseling. Uh, is that like your therapist, or is it a separate separate? I do go to therapists every three to four weeks, but yeah, every other week I go and have a very short session. It's not an intensive, you know, talk through. It's basically you know, how was your week? Did you have any urges? Mm -hmm. um, you know, go over your your test results and all that, and just yeah, talk about. And then I, you know, brought up that I want to, you know, lower my dose and get off of it. Okay. Do you, can you talk about how your therapy, the one that you go to three, every three or four weeks, I believe you said, mm -hmm. how that 
has or has helped with your recovery or if it hasn't at all i you know i don't know cuz obviously i know that you probably worked through a lot of your anxiety and depression while there but mm-hmm. it has it played a, a a positive role in your recovery as well absolutely um my therapist has uh, a good deal of experience working with people uh, substance abuse patients and she's got a lot of great knowledge on the subject and every time i bring something up the way I'm feeling, some experiences I've had, she absolutely knows what I'm talking about, and she has a lot to say about it, and she's been absolutely very helpful. And she was the person who originally got me to seek help, and I reached out to her when I just hit rock bottom and said, hey, this has been going on, because she'd been treating me for like drug-resistant depression and anxiety, extreme anxiety, um, and all the time I had been lying that you know, I had I had not told her what I had been doing. Okay. You know? So you said drug resistant depression anxiety. I just want to make sure that I understand that. That means you were having depression and anxiety because you could not you really wanted to use and could not? Is that kind of and that no. was causing it? Uh, no. Okay. No, what that means is I was being treated for depression and anxiety by a physician and you know through therapy, but it was not getting any better. And I was I just getting worse and worse. And that was because I was not completely honest with I my doctor and therapist. Okay. Uh, you know, it's something in conversations that I have here on Sad Times, but also, uh, you know, in real life, because this isn't real life, Michael. Uh, I think it's important to note how important – oh, Jesus Christ. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I think it's important to point out that the relationship between uh, – a person and their therapist is really important. And you're not always, at least in my estimation, I've been to about 122 therapists and you're not always going to be like, Oh, uh, hi, Tim or whatever the therapist's name may be. You're not always going to mesh with them and that's not their fault. And it's not your fault, but there, it is worth trying. If it doesn't work the first time, it's worth trying again, I think. And I think I just wanted to say that because hearing what you're saying now about, um, the fact that this same therapist is the one who helped you get help the first time and you, you continue to have really positive interactions with her, I think is, is just really worth calling out. And uh, I'm mm-hmm. really thankful to hear that you have that. Definitely the best experience I've had in therapy. And that's why I continue to, to see this therapist. Nice. Yeah. And how long have you been seeing her? Over five years now. Wow. Wow. Wow, you started seeing her in your 60s? Yeah, that's right. Thanks, Kevin. <laughs> You're good at math. I, no, I'm just kidding. But I did have a question. You said that you had your tonsils out when you turned 40. Does that mean that now that I am 40, I have to have my tonsils out? Yeah, that's what it comes down to. It's 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 a law. It's a bylaw somewhere. You it's a bylaw? Down. Yeah. Well, uh, Brent has a law library here. I believe he has a, what was it, a Canadian law library? Mm-hmm. There's two pamphlets over on the wall there. <laughs> yeah. That's, shut up. Okay. And so as somebody who has relapsed and now has been sober for over a year, again, I I commend you. I cannot begin to imagine how difficult that is. And I truly mean that. I, I, do you become more aware of the triggers that might get you into a place where you feel like you might be tempted to use more than say, if that trigger didn't happen? Absolutely. Yeah. Can you tell us about that? I mean, yeah. I never thought, I'm sure everyone that goes into therapy in earnest, wanting to you know, improve their lives and get healthy, they never think, I'm going to go back. Because mm-hmm. at that point, you're like, I cannot believe I've done this to myself. There's no way I'm ever going to do that to myself again. And I, I fell into that thinking that I'm done, so I don't have to be as vigilant. And that's a pitfall that they warn you of. But, you know, of course, you you can hear a thing so many times, mm-hmm. but it's not going to be real for you until you experience right. it. Yeah. I wasn't checking myself. I wasn't being as vigilant with everything as I should have been. And, yes, it's something that I definitely check in with a lot more now. And you, you learn that basically just um, kind of like I say, I often say that I'm – a child who perpetually is touching the stove to see if it is hot. 
Yeah. Uh, it is every goddamn time. But I'm like, no, I'll be all right this time. Ow! Uh, so you kind of learned that the hard way, I guess you're saying, is you had that trigger and you kind of learned, okay, I know that X, Y, or Z is something that I need to be very vigilant of if it's happening. Mm-hmm. And then is that kind of when you kind of go through the steps, as you were saying earlier, and say, okay, now if I were to go down this road, yeah, these are the I things that would happen. and I play it out in my head. Like, mm-hmm. Okay, you're thinking about this. What is that going to bring to you? Mm-hmm. Is that going to be something good or is that going to be completely awful? Yeah. Well, I know that you, you – Again, we said that you have a, a, a ton of stress. Now, you went to 60 meetings in 60 days, as you said, when you first went into recovery. Mm-hmm. Um, and then obviously this time when you started, when you you know relapsed, it was in the middle of a pandemic. Yeah. So it, it's, it's almost like every day you're reminded of, oh, my God, the pandemic fucked that up, too. Mm-hmm. And so something else you didn't think of before. Yeah. Exactly. So were you able to go to meetings or how, how did that work? No, at the point, at that point, um, in-person meetings, I, my normal meeting that I used to go to was not happening and it was just kind of all over the place and Mm -hmm. it's, it's a very vulnerable place. And for something like that, you really want something that's familiar. So if I was going to go back out to in-person meetings, I wasn't really in the mood to search around and Mm-hmm. go to go to a few and see if I could find what I liked. And, you know, it's COVID. I wasn't really wanting to go out anyway. So sure. I did not go to meetings for a while, but I did eventually find online meetings, which are wonderful, such as you know, super easy and anonymous. I joined meetings in, of people in California. You could find one oh. any time of the day or night. Mm-hmm. Just go there and say, you can click a button that says a meeting happening now and it'll show you all the stuff that's happening. Now. Wow. That's wonderful. Yeah. That's mm-hmm. awesome. Uh, one of the rare times on our show where we're going to be like technology. Hey, <laughs> positive. I, and as I've said, that's, there's only two things uh, that are ever good about technology, that and this podcast. <laughs> so yep. everything else. Yeah. Now I See, know that's, that. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Was just, yeah. I can't imagine how difficult it was for so many people Uh, So many people in active addiction or people in early recovery just not having that outlet that I had the first time around that worked so well for me was, you know, just kind of validated all the feelings I was having and made me feel not so alone at the time when I was, this was all completely new to me, that process. So, Yeah. yeah. That's really well said and, and not feeling alone and then think about it. It's compounded. Because somebody who may be struggling with addiction and COVID is mm. very alone, generally, especially yeah. uh, for a good long while there during lockdowns and such. And so to be isolated and then not have that if you're trying to – yeah, that that is mm, terrible. Since you have um, – <clears throat> excuse me. Since you have gotten clean again, you – I know that, like I said, you have stressors. And there's something that you, you were um, – Diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. How long ago was that? My official diagnosis was just September. Just this past but September. Okay. It came right on the heels of me getting clean, me coming off of that relapse. It's I started having symptoms in January. I would just, when I woke up in the morning, I'm like, wow, oh, this is weird. It's It got a little pain, and then the next day it was a little worse, and then it got to where it was difficult to sit up and get out of bed. And this is not normal. Yeah. Did you go to the doctor right away? Yeah, after I think after about a month, like I went back to the people at the clinic. I'm like, I think I'm having a weird reaction to this medication. I'm it's like I'm in more and more pain every morning. Mm -hmm. That does not um, that doesn't click with anything we know about this medication. In fact, it should give you a small you know, relief of pain. Yeah. But it, there's no studies that show this medication causes pain. And I described all the symptoms I've been having. And to her credit, the first counselor I was seeing said, this actually kind of sounds like rheumatoid arthritis. So I started studying that. I found out that there are a number of people in my family that have it and it is a hereditary type of thing. It mm-hmm. runs in families. 
And I saw my regular doctor and spoke about it to him. He said, yeah, that is a thing it could be. Got a referral. I had to wait like seven months to see uh, an actual seven. RA doctor. Seven months. Yeah. Sweet Jesus. Seven yeah. months. Wow. Okay. When I finally saw them, I described what I've been going through and the fact that a couple of times I'd been prescribed steroids. I had a really bad case of poison ivy over the summer and they gave me steroids. And all of a sudden, like my hands don't hurt. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I'm not having these weird pains that I was having. Wow. Yeah. Like my arm would kind of go numb and my hand would hurt my right hand and just very strange stuff. And then as soon as I got on a steroid, it went away. So, so is that kind of the way you treat? I, I don't you – know, actually, is rheumatoid arthritis, is that an autoimmune disorder? It is. Okay. Yes. Um, is that how you're treating it now? That's currently – I'm on a very low-dose steroid every day and also hydroxychloroquine, which even Whoa. though the president might have said so is not a cure for COVID. You, That's also what my doctor said. You take so hydroxychloroquine? I do. That's fucking yeah. awesome. All right. You just got elected I, to the heavy metal hall of fame. Not yeah, only I don't have uh, malaria either. Oh, that's good. That yeah. Ooh, let me tell you something. If you are on um, anti-anxiety or antidepressants and you are on malaria pills, ooh, those don't, those don't get along. No, Jack. So do you think, how did you, I mean, how did that strike you? You're coming off of your relapse. You've gotten clean at the end of December. In January, you start to feel this pain. Did you feel, did you think about what this might mean? Or was it just like, why the hell is this hurting? Or, or did you feel like there was something deeper going on there? First, it was just like confusion and just wondering what the, it felt like too much of a coincidence that it happened right on the heels of, you know, me going back into recovery. Mm -hmm. Like this has to be something else. And then I think my wife said, well, it may have been going on longer. It may have started a few months ago, but you didn't realize because you were killing pain already. So you were in essence treating something on accident. So when I stopped taking pain relieving kill that pills, sorry, because I didn't go back to heroin. I actually was taking uh, pain pills. Okay. That was when I relapsed. Yeah. Gotcha. So, okay. So you've, so you've yeah, had... it did feel like it almost felt like, yeah, a karmic judgment. Like you had your chance, you slipped. And so here, this is what we're going to deal out to you. It's like, this is your punishment for slipping and relapsing. And it's almost like that, type of thinking obviously is going to go in and feed whatever shame or self-loathing you're feeling about, you know, what is, as you said, often a normal part of recovery, I believe mm-hmm. is what you're saying. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I, I, the more people I, I'm learning more and more that people have these autoimmune disorders and that people are just in constant pain. Yeah. And I think we all understand it as a society Uh, apparently the doctors are all full up if you can't fucking get in there for seven months. But I think we understand it as a society as we understand that there are autoimmune disorders, but I don't think we understand, at least myself, what it's like to be in constant pain and like how debilitating and how that really affects a life. Yeah. I mean, we caught it very early, so that's good. Mm -hmm. You know, and we're able to maintain with the low dose steroids right now. And like my hands are much better. I could hardly hold a drumstick this past summer when I was going into the, I was going into the studio to record an album with my band. Mm -hmm. And I was so afraid I was just going to be dropping sticks left and right. Coincidentally, I got poison Ivy the week before we recorded and steroids took care of it. And bam, but. Well, I think the reason it hurt to hold the stick is because rock and roll is the devil's music, Michael. (laughs) You're probably right. Uh, yeah. you're probably about it's it. Instant karma. Instant karma is going to get you. It got me. It's a John Lennon song, Brent. Okay. 
you said that when you relapsed that you had a lot of stress with work and you felt trapped at work. Yeah. I know that you've made some changes in your life kind of in that front. So you have kind of uh, left – Left the 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 normal I, I don't know normal workforce. You left the I'm job that corporate. you were in. Yes, yeah. the corporate workforce, yes. and you started your own business. Isn't that right? I did. Yes, wow. I'm very incredibly fortunate to have been able to do so, and it just all came. It was like a perfect storm. I was so done with being there. I was being overworked, extremely underpaid, underappreciated, and. Just, you know, corporate ruled to death, basically. Cor- what does that it mean? Seemed, it just seems like every day I ran up against, you know, uh, an issue with, you know, what life was giving me and what the corporate rule book said I could do, i.e. like sick days and uh, compassionate leave and things like that. Mm-hmm. Like um, my, uh, another thing that kind of looked, uh, led me to want to leave the corporate world as my brother-in-law was in the hospital for a, a couple of weeks and he did end up dying and just the experience of trying you know to be there with him and there with my family as much as I could and you know the way that people at work treated like it's you know he's he was my brother-in-law but I mean oh so then it's I not didn't, yeah, that Stop didn't matter grief, to me. Perhaps right? okay. Yeah, like they weren't going to even give me a day off to go to his funeral. Then you did. Oh, stuff. there's no bereavement. Oh, he was my brother-in-law, so that oh. doesn't count. I actually had to write an email to the head of HR and you know lay all of this out to even get one day. Wow. Okay. It's ridiculous. Uh, so. And. And you said when did when when was your uh, brother in law in the hospital and when by the way I'm very sorry um, when did he pass away? I believe it was February I believe so it was not much longer not much <laughs> I hadn't been clean that long at that point. So now you have the stress of obviously you know uh, rheumatoid arthritis and the pain and now you're dealing with the sudden loss of your brother in law and you're you're not even two months uh, clean or sober or whatever. So that had to be just immensely stressful. Yeah, it was incredibly stressful. And yet like I, I was not tempted to relapse at all in that time. Mm -hmm. Actually that experience, it's, I just seeing how, his family was affected, how my wife was affected, how his children were affected. And just imagining, you know, if I, you know, just throw caution to the wind and just relapse again for a little bit. And what if I were to die? It's very possible that I could overdose and die. And I just can't imagine putting these people through that pain. Again. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, because again, it was it was not expected, correct? No. He he just had a sudden stroke. He was 39. <sighs> wow. Again, I'm so sorry to hear that, Michael. So that I know it, you you said that you watched his uh well, it's your family, but your your wife's family because I believe it's it's your wife's sister's husband, is that correct? Yes. Yes. How how do you how did the grief hit you? You know when that happened was it was it mainly through how you saw it was affecting the other fam uh, excuse me the other family members? Um, how, how did that how did that come into play for you? He has three kids, um, mm. you know, two in high school, one in middle school, Jeez. and just seeing them realizing that they're not going to have their father there. I can't imagine doing that to my son and just their, their lives are just completely changed and ruined by this, this event. And this just, there's no way that I can feel flippant about putting my own life at risk anymore. Yeah. That's really powerful. Like I, I absolutely do not feel invincible or immortal at all anymore. 
Right. Which I did for so long. You know, that's, it's very cliche to say, you know, I never thought I was going to live past 30, but that's absolutely how I felt when I was young. I did too, actually. Yeah. And too much of that kind of bled over into my life. And it's just, I've seen death before. I've been at people's deathbeds, but this just affected me so acutely. And it sounds like it really, a lot of the reason it affected you so much is because you saw the grief through the eyes of his children. Yeah, absolutely. How how did the grief manifest within you um, other than, you know, kind of what you're saying about it really st- – steeled your resolve uh, about relapsing, et cetera. Mm-hmm. I also, it just, you know, it gives you that life is incredibly short. You don't even know how short. And I was no longer willing to spend my days working for someone else and not being able to be there for my family at the drop of a hat. You know, I would have to make arrangements. I would have to ask permission. I would have to do this and do that. And I knew that if I went out and started my business, that I'd been thinking about it for a while, but never thought I would do it so quickly. Mm -hmm. Just kind of things aligned that I was able to. But now I work whenever I want to. I work regular days pretty much, and I'll work at night too. But if my son needs me, and if you know, I can drop it and just do what I need to do at any time. Right. And that freedom is just and not something I ever imagined I could have. But it just after Josh died, it just seemed so important to have that time and have that ability to be with my family at any time. So And you work out of your home, right? I do. Wow. So it's it's really mm-hmm. if you hear a hat drop you're just like, excuse me, there's a drop of the hat. I need to go over yep. there. Exactly. When did you leave the corporate, kind of the corporate workforce or whatever? The end of May. Mm. So. And so you've been running your own business since then? Yes. That's amazing. And it sounds like not only are you able to be there with your family, be there for your son if you need, say he's uh, sick from school, you could spend the day with him, that type of stuff. How else mm-hmm. has that helped your quality of life? I guess I'm suddenly at a loss for words. That's okay. <laughs> um, it, it's it's a different type of stress, you mm. know. Mm-hmm. Like it's it's up to me, yeah, to make that amount of money to cover our bills and do all that. But there's a freedom in the way I do it. You mm. know, it's all up to me. I can set uh, my hours. But like I said, for me, it really had to be. Basically, like I just moved, uh, I just basically started my job at home. I work banker's hours, but I can also work extra and I can switch the hours out. I know I'm just kind of be saying the same. No, thing it's so okay. <laughs> but uh, you have autonomy is what you're saying. And you, you can make absolutely. those decisions. Yes. And I think, what do, what do they call it? Uh, the great resignation or, or something like that. I think, mm-hmm. um, you know, one of the things that is is hard to maybe understand about this is I, I think it's awesome. I think a lot of people maybe who are listening to this say, oh, I wish I could you know, leave my job and et cetera, but I can't because of X, Y, or Z. There's a bravery in it too, uh, I, I believe. And it's, it, it, it's kind of scary, right? Because it's up to you absolutely. now. Absolutely. Yeah. It's up to you. Yeah, at the end of the day. Like, I'm not going to get a paycheck if I don't do the work. Right. So it's it's all up to me, and that's scary and invigorating. Yeah, it, and, it'll 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 uh, kick your ass sometimes, right? Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. But then I can also just, you know, come into work at 9 p.m. and hunker down and get a bunch of stuff done, and then I can have a slower day in the morning if I need to. You know, 9 p.m.? coming up. Yeah. Shouldn't you be asleep, Mike? That's when I'm asleep. Oh, 9 p.m. My son doesn't uh, get to sleep till about 8 or something usually. So, Your my, son is a sec- crack shot with the Nerf gun, I must say. Yes, indeed. Yeah. <laughs> so like my second day starts there in the evening. Okay. Okay. Well, I tell you what, that 9 p.m., if I'm not in bed by 8, <laughs> something's wrong. So you lost your brother-in-law in February. You 
uh, started your own business and, and have been doing that since the end of May. Uh, you've talked about the, the improved quality of life. I, I do have a question. So having all of this time, right, obviously you're busy all the time, but mm. does, does your do you find that your mind wanders more uh, because it's you who – it's up to you as we were talking about. Do you find that mm. you're feeling um, – more anxious? Do you do you get more anxiety? Do you find yourself thinking about more negative things because your your brain is is allowed to wander, or is that not something that you've dealt with? Um, it's not as frequent. It's not as frequent as I would have thought. Mm -hmm. You know, I thought I've been worrying all the time, but it's no. It, that's the rare occasion, rather than you know the rule. That's not something I deal with every day. I just. Is that kind something of, you have to work at, or is that just kind of how it's played out because of everything else falling into place? I think I've been fortunate that you know, I've felt kind of secure in what I'm doing from from the get go, mm -hmm. and I haven't. I didn't really have to. I. It's hard to explain, but I've been working toward uh, making this thing a business for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And I'd, I'd made it into kind of my side gig, and I knew that there was a gap, you know, between – there was a gap between, you know, what I could make part-time and what I would have to make if I jumped to full-time. And just not knowing exactly if I could get there, but it's basically the, the business was going well as a part-time thing, and I knew that it could scale up if I gave mm -hmm. it full-time. But mm -hmm. I didn't really have a way to test that theory. Just, I just, just had to do it. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, you know, I, I want to offer to you as well. If you have somebody in your town who's running a similar business and you want to put them out of business, I'm happy <laughs> to sell you a picture of my face to put it on a billboard <laughs> and just say that this guy, this is who you're giving your money to. And that money will start coming to you, buddy. I will keep that in mind. Thank you. That's... Oh, good. So you mentioned many times you have a son. I do. Uh, and you, how old is your son? He's five. Cinco. He's five. Let's see. I think that it, it would be, it, it's just, I'll just say the cliche thing, right? Parenting is, it, the cliches are cliches for a reason. And parenting, I, I have no children. But parenting seems to me about the hardest thing in the world. Uh, well, yeah, if you want the cliche, it's the hardest job you'll ever love. That's what they say. All right. We can go ahead and stop recording now. <laughs> that was – Yeah. Jesus Christ, yeah, I Mike. Have done that. The hardest I, – you know, I must have heard that before, but the hardest oh, job yeah. you'll ever love. Is it five years old and your son, by the way, great kid, great kid, and, and the thing about – you know, I, I visited Michael over the summer. Uh, I was there for, what, like five days, I think. And, you know, every night uh, Michael was with his son playing baseball or with his son playing catch or taking him over and saying, hey, let's try this or let's go on, a, you know, all this stuff. So you're so attend attentive to him. But you're also you're doing that, but also making clear what the boundaries are as far as behavior goes and and all of that stuff, right? So, is that this is a stupid question, but like, do you just kind of learn on the job? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, just I don't want. He is our only child, and he is the only child we're gonna have. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to waste any of that time. You know, I don't want to look back and say, you know, I didn't play with him as much as he would have liked. I didn't, you know, spend enough time with him. Mm -hmm. I want to be that parent that's there for him, whatever he needs. Yeah. It, what are what are some of the most challenging parts of being a parent of a five year old? Well, we were playing chess the other day, and yeah, yeah, he, he four moved he, mated you, didn't he? He thought that he was about to have my king, but he forgot a little rule and he lost. Uh oh, boy, he was not happy. 
No, did uh, he? No, he played. He played an actual halfway decent game of chess the other day. I I gave him hints and told him things that were coming and things that he could and could not do, but he actually played it. But so, no, some of the hardest stuff <laughs> being a parent is the real question. Well, yeah, but but did he? When you say he wasn't happy, like did he have kind of a tantrum type of thing that he lost? Oh yeah, he. Uh, I I tried to shake his hand and he slapped it away. Whoa. And yeah, he told me I cheated. You know, what, kids Michael? don't take that's S- sad times is known for the hard hitting questions. So I'm just going to hit you with this one. <laughs> did you cheat? I did not cheat. Did you cheat I to beat not. your five year old at chess? I did not. I cheated to let him get as close as he did. <laughs> I, I cheated for him. Well, like I said, you're a very nice man. I, I do my best. But no, I sat down with him afterwards and talked about how you want to be gracious in defeat and how this is actually something I've spoken with him a few times Mm -hmm. about lately is that when he tries something, he's good at it in the beginning. Like he tries almost anything and he's pretty good out of the gate. Mm-hmm. But he doesn't want to work to improve, and he mm. he's very unhappy if he's just not instantly winning at everything he does. And that's just a kid thing; they don't know, you know they they don't yeah they don't know about uh, losing and and not getting stuff. And he's lucky that he's really good at a bunch of stuff right out of the gate. So yeah, he's having a lot of trouble you know, processing. Yeah. I mean, you said it's a kid thing. I I think it I think it's a human thing, right? Mm-hmm. I'm if I do something for the first time and I I'm just not awful at it, which um, hasn't happened yet, but when it happens, <laughs> uh, I imagine that I'm going to be like, "Well, that's it. Done with that and then move on." Mm-hmm. So, this these are really good uh, lessons to instill. And if I was 5 years old and I slapped my father's hand away, <laughs> well, I tell you what, I tell you what. Um, okay, so he, you um, did not cheat. Did not. Okay. What other? What are some of the other really challenging things with parenthood? This another challenging thing, and it seems kind of unique, but I guess it's kind of always been a thing with TV and all that stuff. But parenting a child with screens, mm-hmm. it's very difficult because I mean. Yeah, I think I know nice. what you mean. What does that mean to parent a child with screens? What do you mean by that? It's nice for them to be able to sit there and, you know, watch, you know, a show that's okay for their age and, you know, sit there and do that for a while. But when they want to just go to that screen all the time and mm-hmm. you got to teach them boundaries and you got to teach them stuff that is not appropriate. And cause, cause he likes to watch YouTube and that's just a slippery slope. You can mm-hmm. watch, you have YouTube kids, but then there'll be channels that seem like they're for kids. And all of a sudden he's talking to us about the games in Squid Game. And he knows what, like, what the games are. <laughs> it's like, what? Where did you learn this? And it was from a kid's channel. They just made like kid style games, but they used all the terms. And so he knows what all the games in Squid Game are, but he doesn't know how horrific they all were. Jesus Christ. So, yeah. You have to be right on top and see what they're actually watching. No, seriously, and where were you, Jesus Christ, <laughs> to allow that? No, I'm just kidding. Go ahead. But yeah, if you get busy and you're, you're kind of rely on the screen too much, when you try to take it away, like it really shows you that it's not a great thing to have too much screen time because he will get angry, and all kids do. And so we're trying to limit the screen time and trying to make sure that it's only positive content, but it's very difficult. Hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I mean, was, even though, yeah, we had TV growing up, it's a very uh, different animal. Well, it's way, it's way different. Uh, yeah. There was only kid shows, at least for the most part, other than Sesame street. There's only really kid shows on, on Saturday mornings, you know? Yeah. I mean, you, there was a channel where we could come home and there would be like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And That's stuff a good like point. That Chipping Dale's afternoon. Rescue Rangers was a big one yeah, for me. That type of stuff. Uh, but, but yeah, they could just have, you know, scroll and yeah. Who knows it's what just everything right there, right now. 
Yes, which exactly. causes so problems I, for me. I can't imagine for somebody who has not understood what, you know, as you said, the boundaries and such. Yeah, and how does that affect like a five-year-old's brain? Yeah. So, so, so. I've heard parent parenting also described as it's like your heart walking around on the outside of your body. I feel that. Yeah. Is it just uh, as somebody with anxiety and 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 has has struggled with this? Is it just really fucking scary? It definitely can be. And I try not to let my anxiety rule how he lives his life. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. you know, I don't want to you know, be overprotective of him in a way that will you know, diminish his life experience. Like, I don't want to keep him from anything because of my fears, if that makes it does. any sense. So, like, we're out playing baseball. Um, he hits the ball across the street. I say, stop. You know, he looks and he goes and gets it himself. I'm not going to be like, stay there. I'll go get it. Yeah. Cause I'm afraid a car is going to come out of nowhere. He's got to learn these things. So yeah, he's got to learn to look both ways. Right. Yeah. Even though my first instinct might be stay away from that road forever. I'll get the ball. Right. I, I think that always... that's pretty common. Yeah, I can't always be there to protect him, and I know that. So yeah, I had a dog for six months, and whoo, buddy, I could barely mm. handle that. So I, I don't, mm, I, I just every person who's a parent, which obviously is a ton of people, uh, yeah. I, I, I give them can just continued. Uh, it's just amazing to me. Um, I love have, it. Have you ever talked with him about anxiety at all? In limited ways. Mm -hmm. Just do you worry that do, he's going to be anxious? Oh, I, yeah, absolutely. I'm I'm afraid. Yeah, you know that he'll end up with some of the thinking processes and the stuff that I have. And I yeah. don't want that for him, of course. So. That's one of the reasons I haven't honestly mm -hmm. never had kids because I was so afraid of passing my brain on to somebody mm -hmm. else. Yeah, it's um, it's not a good brain. Well, Mike. Your triumphant return as the returning champion of Sad Times. Uh, once again, you have been uh, kind and generous and forthright with your time. Um, and uh, thank you so much for sharing your experience, for being so vulnerable to even talk about, hey, look, I messed up and I'm working every day at it. Unfortunately, I think that that's something that's very universal for a number of people. And the fact that you were so honest and kind and are, are able to share your story, uh, I know it will help people feel less alone. Um, is there anything else that you, so. yeah, that you wanted to say or cover that we didn't cover or any message that you'd like to kind of, kind of say as your, your party message? I don't know. There's, there's a million things knowing that I was going to be coming on this show. I thought of so many things, but <laughs> you don't have to say anything. it's okay no, i am not it's not like i'm searching for one thing to say i'm just trying to express that yeah just knowing i was going to have this platform mm. of course there are a thousand things i would like to talk about but i think this pretty much got to all the points of the stuff that i wanted to update okay. after being here the yeah first time. okay well again thank you so much for being on for sharing your story and um, also, obviously, for your 22 years of friendship. Um, and uh, for everybody out there listening, thank you so much for joining us today on Good Old Sad Times. And, um, you know, just know that if you're out there and you're having a hard time, there's always room. There's always room for kindness and grace. And um, even when it's when you're being really hard on yourself and um, just know that you're not alone. And thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. You've been listening to a fourth-hand joint.